Hi, welcome to my podcast, Books from Abhinav. I am Abhinav Hansaraman, your host for this show. Over the last 3-4 days, I have tried really coming out with a nice script, looking at the script, reading at it and recording for this show. But unfortunately, that takes way too much time, gives me way little in terms of content and is frankly too hard for me to do. So what I really want to do today is just tell you what I am going to do in this podcast, tell you one book I really enjoyed in the last year, tell you some interesting trivia and then tell you what you can look forward to in the coming episodes. So let me start by telling you what this podcast is and what this podcast is not. This podcast is just me, a pure sharing things that I've learned from reading a book. It is not supposed to be me teaching you because I don't think I'm any better than you are. I don't know much more than you do. We just have different interests and I'm sure you have a lot of things that I could learn from you. And I think there are some things that you could perhaps learn from this podcast. So I am not talking down to you. I am not trying to teach you things. I just found this book very cool. I just found this trivia very cool. And I just want to share it with you. Now, what are the problems that I'm trying to solve with this podcast? All of us consume a lot of content. We consume tons of content almost on a daily basis. But there are two problems that we can solve today. One is that we tend to not know what content we really want to consume. Sure, if there are 100 posts on Instagram we see every day, 200 tweets we see every day. Sure, we are consuming content, but that isn't meaningful content or content that really adds value to us. So we need to figure out what long form or real content that we need to consume. Second thing, there are just too many book recommendations and too many recommendations on what to read today. See, if somebody like Bill Gates is telling me what five books to read this summer, I can't truly relate with it. Like I am not running a multi-billion dollar company or a foundation that's trying to change the world. But if a friend tells me some book that they really enjoy reading, it's far more likely that I pick that book up and read. Which is why I want to solve this problem and tell you what I enjoy reading as a 24 year old. Now that the formalities are out of the way, let's get into the book. The book I am discussing today is Give and Take by Adam Grant. Now, Adam Grant is an organizational psychologist and is a prof at Wharton. I'll tell you the basic premise of the book. There are three kinds of people. Givers, takers and matchers. Givers are people who are other-centric and focus on generating value for others. Takers are self-centric and want to corner value for themselves. Matchers, on the other hand, operate on the principle of fairness and will generate for value for others if the recipient can help them out later. Now, I know what you're thinking. You think this book is going to be a huge sermon on helping others, being Mother Teresa and all. That is not the case. And honestly, if that's the kind of book there is, I wouldn't be reading it. Sure, it's good to help others. But why would I help you if it would cost me time and money and my efforts? Why would I help you if there's no, not, no gains in it for me? Why would I help you if I don't know who you are? Those are important questions it comes when it comes to helping others or being a giver. In this book, he doesn't make value judgments on, oh, you're a taker, you're a bad person, you're horrible, you're a menace to society. He's just saying, boss, if you're a giver, there are certain benefits, there are certain problems, and these are some solutions to some of those problems. So it will not be him telling you to be what kind of a person. It's only arguments in being in favor of being a giver. If you wanted the book in a one-line summary, it is give to others irrespective of looking at what is in it for you, it will probably come back and help you tomorrow. If you still want to stick around and discuss this book with me, here goes. See, there are five major lessons I've learned in it. The first one, as I told you, is a one-line summary. If you just be a giver, don't try to find out what is in it for you and what is in it for them. If it will just take you five minutes or a very little amount of work and effort and money, just do it. It will just help you. It will obviously help the person who is looking for help. The second thing is that if you're a giver, you're either going to rise to the top of your industry or your profession or you're going to sink to the absolute bottom. It takes a lot to figure out how to be in the former category and not in the latter category. And that's a large problem that this book tries to address. Now, if you're wondering why is it that a giver would rise to the top of any organization, he gives three solid reasons. Essentially, if you're a giver, it will take a lot of time for you to build goodwill and trust and probably in the time you're spending to build goodwill and trust and not doing self-serving things, you are going to lose out on a lot of things. But this goodwill and trust, once you earn it, it will establish your reputation, it will create rest, uh, relationships and that enhances your success. So two of the case studies he looks at are salespeople. Like this is one car salesman he looks at and there are a the couple of medical students he looks at where he says the advantages of being a giver only grow over time. Sure, in your first two, three years of being a salesman or a salesperson, if you're trying to focus too much on what the client needs and not looking at your incentives in terms of, oh, even if this is a bad car I'm trying to sell, if I sell it, I'll probably get like a nice, nice three month salary worth of bonus. If you're not doing that in the first two, three years, you're, you are going to make lose on money that you could have made. 
you're going to lose money you could have otherwise made by being a self centric person if you're trying to be a giver however in the long run if you know that if you when you tell somebody that a car is good it actually means that the car is good and you're not saying it only because you want to earn a bonus that really cements the relationship between you and your customer and think about it no if you're a car salesman there are a lot of times your customer is going to buy cars from you and the more and more they come back to you the more and more they trust you in their lifetime they're going to buy four or five cars right in a period of say 40 50 years if they buy four or five cars and they are very solid not only will they buy cars from you they'll also do a lot of word of mouth marketing their friends and family will come to you so in the long term you are going to make a lot of money from being a giver now what are the other things he talks about he said yeah there's a very nice uh, quote that this guy called uh, chip conley who's a apparently renowned entrepreneur who runs a hotel says he says that being a giver is not is not about is not the 100 meter dash that you're trying to win it's about a marathon where it's very valuable in the long run it's a very valuable skill or a tag to have which is being a giver now the next thing that i learned in this book is that you always have to pay it forward right a lot of us are where we are not because of some inherent skill short privilege and that that whole argument aside a lot of us are where we are because people took chances with us maybe it was your first job you weren't really a great pressure somebody thought hmm let's give this kid a chance maybe it's a promotion you probably didn't deserve that but somebody thought you know what this person's been with us for so long this person's trustworthy why don't we give them a chance that is how most of us have be are, i mean i am just a beginner in this but i am assuming whoever you are there is somebody who's really looked out for you somebody who's paid it forward to you and that's why you are where you are right the second thing that the book talks about is that this is something you need to do you need to pay it forward to your juniors or people who are coming to you for help or whatever the next lesson in this book is that as a giver there are two mistakes you're likely to make one is you trust too easily the second is you're not screening for sincerity in terms of trusting too easily like this is essentially the market for lemons problem right if you believe that the other person is also going to treat you fairly there are certain assumptions you will make and your behavior would be modified accordingly but if that turns out to be untrue and you act as a pure unselfish giver you are you are going to face adverse consequences it could be minor it could be major but there's a very good chance you'll face adverse consequences the second problem is that you're not screening for sincerity there are many times we've all asked for help when we didn't need it or when we didn't truly deserve that help but we asked for it because getting that help would have just made our life easier even if it was not fair on the other person these are wrong things that we do but we all do it and there's no there, like there's no point in saying oh i've never done this in life most of us have done occasionally frequently many times but we have now on the other side when you are the person providing help how do you trust i mean how do you screen for sincerity is the request for help coming from a position of sincerity is there some truth to it is there some honesty to it that these are the two major problems that adam grant thinks givers usually make now that half of the book is done adam comes to the solutions to the two major problems he's identified there are essentially two major solutions he's suggesting one is that you start with this thing called an adaptable giver or it's a generous straight for tact you start by assuming that the other person is nice and is being fair to you if you later find out that they're not actually being a giver they're being unfair to you or they're being a taker then what if you found, find out that the other person is not being fair you still act as a giver except that every two out of three times you do act as a taker that, so that they understand where you're coming from that you can respond that there is state for that right that is one solution that he offers now the second solution he offers is that there is a huge difference be, between being a giver or being nice and being a taker or being self centric right you can be a nice taker you can be a you can be an other centric person also these are two different things it's very possible that you are a nice taker but a rude giver so don't confuse niceness with and being a giver that's the second point you has to offer then the second the next major heading the third major he- heading he has to offer is the assertiveness and advocacy paradox which is essentially that boss when you are helping somebody else you know when you're making a case for somebody else when you're arguing for somebody else if you are going to be assertive and try to get the best possible outcome for them why don't you do it for yourself right if you can do it for somebody else you are your biggest client you are your biggest resource in that sense so that is something he thinks we should focus on and that's something i kind of completely agree with see i know what i've tried to do is compress like a huge 300 page book into 10 minutes which is not possible and it's a bad idea but thing is there are so many things so many other things you can learn in this book like what is the value of a weak tie or a dormant tie right in terms of if you're trying to do something new if you're trying to do something big in life you will receive a lot of support from your immediate friends and family you know but those connections that you made 10 years ago you know a classmate you used to hang out with in say in school who's now doing very well in life or is just being very nice to you they are far more likely and to give you help offer you help and put your name forward than somebody who's very close to you which i think is true to some extent so that is some, again that's something better explored in the book and i can't ex- like explore it in like the next 30 seconds or so there are also other things that he talks about when when does when does a giver face burnout like 
to stop a giver from facing burnout do you just stop giving them more work or is it more like them getting to see the rewards of what they've done for example if you're teaching in a school for underprivileged kids and you're facing a lot of work you don't find you know fulfillment satisfaction etc is the solution to that to give you less work and ask you to take one class instead of two classes or to actually show that boss you've taught you've taught 30 kids if not for you they might have become violent they might not have had like good food at home they might have ad- had other struggles but because you've come and done these things these are the positive outcomes that they've had in their life and actually show you the impact of what you've done which i think also applies largely to many, many of the things we do like many of my friends who are unhappy with their job at times when i'm i don't like the things i do it's because i don't see the impact of what i'm doing like right now when i'm making this video it's very hard for me to like sit and do like the 3 4 hours of at least 3 4 hours of editing that this video will take for such a low quality video it takes that much work i don't want to do it unless i see i see the impact right now there is no impact it's probably like five of my friends who will view this and tell me hey good job boss or something like that but once you start seeing an impact in what you're doing that is when you can put up like pile on more work and do it even though you're working more as as long as you see the impact of what you're doing you still be able to do that work okay now that we've gone and discussed the book and all let's chill back a bit and just like discuss something i think is far more interesting for me and far more interesting for you so it's just like in and trivia which doesn't have an impact on the world which doesn't make a large statement but it's fun to know so let's say you're a rational consumer customer and i hope you are if you had to choose between you know a brand new like a very cool whatever cute color iphone price and a second hand used iphone price which one would you be willing to pay more for i think all of us would agree that we'd pay more for the new product rather than a second hand one because i mean it just feels better no like opening that box opening that plastic cover and it just feels so good so you'd prefer paying more for that but that's actually not always true if you look at how bajaj chetak uh, scooters were sold in the pre liberalization era if you if, even if you wanted to pay full price get the scooter from the company you would get on a 10 year waiting list think about it, waiting 10 years to get a freaking scooter right now how do you get it faster obviously you, you can't bribe there's only so much you can do to get a scooter right and there were, you have to understand this was like proper bureaucracy like proper red tape isn't it? because the scooter companies couldn't even produce the scooters they wanted to because there was a huge demand on steel and all the the country has an insane controls if you've experienced like the benefits of capitalism you really can't understand how the, how things work back in those days but i'm sure they had their reasons but if you wanted to get a scooter very quickly what you could do is you could just go to somebody who has that scooter pay them a slightly higher amount of money but you could get a scooter sure you're only getting a second hand used scooter which probably has some damages not but that's the only way you can actually get a scooter and for that you're willing to pay a premium even more than the price that you'd have had to pay for a scooter that's coming brand new from the company now it's not very interesting i'm not trying to make like large scale statements on what forms of governance work better but it's actually fascinating to know that somebody like everybody almost everybody would pay far more for a used scooter than a brand new scooter back in india of all places Okay now that that's out of the way the point of this whole video is not to tell you oh this is the book and these are the things that valuable actions and insights i've taken into my life and improved i don't think so I'll like sure some of this has helped me become a better person i think some of this has given me tangible outcomes but the point is it is a fun book to read and i think this is more of a self help typeish books right against other self helpish books that people usually read this has like like you get where the idea is coming from it's backed by some sort of data not all of it is very reliable but there's some there's some sort of a scientific approach to that book and that's why i think it's a very good book to read our second thing is that i hope you enjoyed watching this video please like like comment subscribe you know the usual thing bro right and i want to keep posting every saturday and i hope like my content gets better i know this is not good enough for like good viewers like you i hope and i'll try to make sure my content becomes better i'll i'll give you good stuff and hopefully you'll have more fun in the future thanks